The National Broadcasting Company invites you by transcription to join the chase. There is always the hunter and the hunted, the pursuer and the pursued. It may be the voice of authority or a race with death and destruction, the most relentless of the hunters. There are times when laughter is heard as counterpoint and moments when sheer terror is the theme. But always there is the chase. For some people, there is only one chase and no other exists. The chase to secure and hold money. Nothing, nothing else matters. There is no love except for pennies, dimes, and dollars. And only hate for those who would deprive them of it. Hear those footsteps? A man running down a street in a cheap section of a city just after nightfall. Watch him. He's leading us to just such people. He darts across a narrow street without looking. He comes to the intersection of a street and alley just as a car turns the corner. Hey, you hit him. How bad? He's dead. What are we going to do? Do? Get out of here. Drag him in that alley. Yeah, but he's dead. That's hit and run. We ought to do You some... hurt me. Drag him in that alley. Let's get out of here. Yes, the man lying dead in the alley marked the beginning of a story. A very important story to Mr. and Mrs. Crocky, Albert and Carolyn... Two lovely people who run a boarding house a few blocks away. It's a vital story to them because it involves money. And anything that involves money is more important than life itself to Mr. and Mrs. Crocky. And another thing, Albert. You gotta go up and see Mr. Sedgwick right this minute. Because he ain't paid his rent for next week. He's a new boarder. And it's best that we show him right off that we ain't gonna put up with back rent. Well... Be a lot better if we get that Mr. Sedgwick out of here. I don't like the looks of him. Besides, he burns the electric a lot at night. Oh, it's getting so two honest people ain't able to run a decent, respectable place no more. Mm. Well, anyhow, you go right up and see that Mr. Sedgwick. It ain't right. Uh, Who's there? Your star boarder, Mr. Campion. Uh, All right. Good evening, Albert. Carolyn. You ain't to call us by our first names. I told you that. Oh, merely a friendly gesture on my part, Mr. Crocky. But I did not descend into these charming quarters of yours to discuss the amenities of nomenclature. Now, now, stop that fancy talk. And don't bring that cigarette in here. You ain't been smoking in bed. No, but uh, it's an idea. At least the feeble glow would provide more light than the ceiling fixture. Oh, you complaining again? Now, you look here, Mr. Uppity Campion. You're getting a good room at a reasonable rent. There ain't many boarding houses in the city. No, where you could no, go and... no, no, no. You're perfectly right. There aren't many boarding houses in the city where the boarders have to race home at night to make sure they can get their own evening paper. Or where the owners get up at four in the morning to steal the cream off the top of the milk. Are you calling us thieves? Mm, no, I don't think so, Mrs. Crocky. I'd have to qualify that. Sneak thieves, I should say. You? you? Oh, no, no, no. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Let's, let's don't argue about it. Well, now, what about the hot plate in my room? What's the matter with it? Well, it belies its name, Mr. Crocky. It is no longer a hot plate. It has become a refrigerator. You broke it. In the passage of time, sweet Carolyn, mechanical and electrical appliances do get out of order. But we can't get parts, Mr. Campion. All right. Let's go on to something else. The, uh, the bedspread, for example. 
It's become one of the most exciting games I've ever played to find a spot in the spread free from holes. It embarrasses me when I have guests. Oh, we can't afford a new one, Mr. Campion. All right. We shall forget the bedspread and take up the subject of the ceiling fixture. Uh, that ain't broke. Well, no, no, not exactly. But it certainly is eccentric. It goes on and off, Mr. Crocky, like a lighthouse. No human hand touches it, and yet it flashes ambitiously, energetically. Ah, well, you keep finding fault with everything. Oh, but I'm not alone, friend Crocky. I am not alone. I heard Miss Barton complaining earlier tonight about her sink. It's her fault. She combs her hair over it, and the hair falls in and blocks the drain. Yes, but... Oh, <laughs> I give up. Such slippery and adroit excuse-making is beyond my power of refutation. Of what? Nothing, nothing at all. Well, now that I've registered my complaint, I shall retire to the damp chill of the crypt I occupy, and for which I pay $68 a month. If you don't like it, you can get out. Well, that, Mrs. Crocky, is a line which becomes you so well. Good night. Young puppy. For two cents, I... Uh... Two cents? Such extravagance, Mr. Crocky, and from you, all people. Good night. Well, I... Albert, as soon as we can. We'll put him out. No, 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 Carolyn. Carolyn, uh, it might be hard to rent that room. Yeah, he does pay regular. Well... Hmm. Oh... Hmm? Mr. Sedgwick. Huh? You go right on up there and get the money for Mr. Sedgwick. Now, Carolyn, now maybe he'll bring it down. Night ain't over yet. You're scared of him. Well, I don't like, like the way he looks at me. We'll both go. Huh? All right. There goes that Miss Barton. Run the water again to wash her hair. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Miss Barton, you close off that water good. And don't use too much. <laughs> there. She knows all right. Her being a day behind with the rent. <laughs> Mr. Sedgwick? Mr. Sedgwick? Your lovely knuckles, Carolyn. You'll but... skin them. You shut up. Or wouldn't you rather I told you that Mr. Sedgwick went out? How do you know? Well, I saw him leave his room and go out the front door some time ago. Now go away and stop pounding. I have work to do. Hmm. I'd like to slap that smart alecky Mr. Campion's face for him. Now, no, no, never mind, Carolyn. Let's go for our walk. Uh, yes, Mr. and Mrs. Crocky, you are a remarkable couple. You do take the cream from the milk, and you do read the newspapers before the boarders get home to save a couple of pennies. And now you go for your walk. Oh, not for exercise, though. It's to save electric light bills. Every night it's the same. Down the same street, past the warehouse, over to the brewery and along the street running through the wholesale district until you finally get sleepy and turn homeward. Albert, if that smart Mr. Campion tells you that he ain't using electric light in that lamp he bought, he's lying. If you just catch him at it. He's got enough light in his room. He don't need no more lamps. It's costing us money to put up with him. That's right, Albert. Oh, oh, money, money. We always got troubles. Uh, wait, wait a minute. It's a man laying there. Yeah. Mm, drunk, most likely. That's right. Honest people have to slave for their money, and something no good like this drinks it up. I don't smell the liquor. <laughs> Maybe. I'm going to look closer. 
Keep away from him, Albert. Maybe it's a trap. He might be a hold-up man. Carolyn. Mr. Sedgwick. It is. Look. What's the matter with him? He's he dead. Albert. Looks like maybe he got hit by an auto. <laughs> What's that? His pocket. It's stuffed with money. And him owing oh, us rent. Hm. But look, look, Carolyn. It's, it's so, so, so much. Albert. What, what, what do you suppose? Shh. Ain't nobody in sight. It's, it's so much money. Like as not he come by it bad. I never did like the way he looked. Like, like... One of them gangsters. Uh, he wouldn't do no good oh, with it. Oh, he owes us rent. It's his kind that would spend it on some chorus girl. Uh, you and me, we... Albert, Albert, you gonna do it? Or ain't you? No, well, there ain't nobody watching. Ain't nobody saw him before us either. Or there wouldn't be no money. Albert. No, Carolyn, come on, come on. I got it. <laughs> So you've taken the money from Mr. Sedgwick, Calbert, and Carolyn. But look, isn't someone behind you? Faster. Walk faster. Just a shadow, wasn't it? But you didn't know that, Mr. and Mrs. Crocky. That money is heavy in your pocket, isn't it, Albert? Faster now, both of you. Hurry home to hide the money in the mattress. Yes, in the mattress with the rest of your miser's hoard. But faster again. The memory of Mr. Sedgwick lying back there is pursuing you, and you've got to get away. Faster now. Faster. Oh, oh Carol. Not lock the door. Uh. You didn't lose it. Did you, Albert? No, no, I... I got it right here. Oh, got to get into our room now. Put it in the mattress. Well, well... Uh, uh, Mr. Kemp. Back early, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. Were you expecting someone else? No. No, I wasn't. Well, what have yeah. you been doing? Running? No. Why should we be running? Well, I don't know. You might have heard the Nikolai dropped upstairs and were chasing each other to see who'd get it. You you ain't funny, Mr. Campion. I, I wasn't trying to be funny, Albert. Oh, you shut up. Well, what's the matter with you two? Mr. Crocky ain't feeling good. As a matter of fact, he does look a little pale around the gills. Someone's been chasing you. No, nobody chased Why us. Why did you ask that? Well, from the way you dashed in here, I thought perhaps you'd robbed a bank or something. We're honest people. To, uh, to a certain extent, yes. Are you calling us thieves again? I explained that once before tonight. But you two certainly do look excited. And the only thing that could bring a flush to your careworn cheeks would be money. Perhaps left by a rich uncle. We ain't got any uncle. And that ain't no way to talk, Mr. Campion. Okay. Okay, we'll forget it. I'm going for a walk. Walk? Well, sure, sure. Why not? Ceiling fixture gave up the ghost altogether a few minutes ago. I can't work anymore. Which way are you walking? Well, does that make any difference? Of course not. Uh, but uh, it's uh, it's a damp out. <laughs> Might catch a chill. You know, your solicitude is amazing. Can this be the crockies? The same people who all through the winter dole out heat by fractions of degrees? Um, uh, uh, Mr. Campion, <laughs> that ceiling fixture, uh, I got some wire. Uh, maybe we could fix it. Tell me, is your name by any chance Scrooge? Who? What Marley's ghost accosted you along the way and forced you into a recognition of the error of your way? Huh? In other words, what the devil happened outside? Uh, nothing, nothing. You want that light fixed, do you? Well, unless I'm to become a mole, light would be welcome, yes. Then you go right along with Mr. Crocky, Mr. Campion. Ah, uh -huh. What's the matter? I see. See what? Mr. Crocky has What the... have I got? 
The wire, the wire, the wire to fix the ceiling fixtures. And if I help him, it saves the electrician's fee for you. You're always poking fun at us. Oh, no, Mrs. Crocky. No, indeed. But, uh, come along, Albert. You and I shall play Steinmetz to the ceiling fixture. Oh, and Mrs. Crocky. Huh? I should still like to know what encounter brought you to home before sleep deadened your elfin steps and dulled those brilliant minds. Uh, you coming, Mr. Campion? Certainly, Mr. Crockett. Albert, hmm? you better leave that package with me. Oh, I, I forgot. Package? Albert, give it to me. I'm going to leave you alone with it. Now, uh, Mr. Campion. Yes, Albert. Um, there's wire and stuff in the cellar. Now, you get it yourself. Uh, uh... Here. Here's the key to the basement. Oh, no. Wonder of wonders, the key to the crocky cellar. And shall I find vintage 192? Or perhaps the skeletons of former boarders? You, uh, you fixed a light, Mr. Campion. If there's anything you need, you can buy it tomorrow. We'll pay you for it. Numb. Absolutely numb, I am. This is the epitome of surprise. The key to the cellar, an offer of payment by the Crockies all in one evening. Oh, I shall certainly write this to Mr. Ripley. Nay, nay, I shall insist upon another time capsule sunk into the ground to record this event for posterity. You're going to fix it or not? Oh, certainly, certainly. Tomorrow I may see the Crockies back in usual form. Therefore, tonight I shall gather the golden fruits of whatever occasion this munificent behavior. Callan, you're a fool. You mentioned package, and it ain't in the package. I want to see how much is there. We could have counted it later. How do I know that you wouldn't have took some for yourself? Oh, you shut up. Come on. We'll count it in our room. So you count the money, Mr. and Mrs. Crocky. And how much is there? A hundred? Keep counting. Three hundred? Oh, much more. Five hundred, seven, a thousand. Keep counting. Perspiration is beating your foreheads. Your hands are damp. The bills stick to your fingers. Now you reach two thousand. They're all hundreds. One, zero, zero on each bill. Two thousand, three, thirty-five hundred, and you're not through yet. Keep counting, counting. Your breath hot, your eyes glazed with greed. Ah, now you're finished counting. Five. Five thousand dollars. <laughs> we found it. We, we, we just found it. We went for a walk. We found it. <laughs> Not so loud. You'll wake everybody. We're in. Cedric gets run over by a hit and run driver, and we get his money. Shh, We're shh, in. Shh, shh. <laughs> Uh, who's there? Uh, Campion. Is anything wrong? No, there's nothing the matter. But I thought I heard Mrs. Crocky. Uh, did, you, did you fix the light? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, wait a minute. I got the key to the cellar. Uh, put it under the door. Put it under the door. Quiet. Just shove it under. Okay, but are you sure there's nothing wrong? Uh, just go to bed. Well, I'm going out for a walk. If anyone calls, I'll be back in half an hour. Yeah, but he can't go. Maybe you go the way we did and you'll see him. Did you hear me? Sure, sure. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Campion. Yes? Uh, it, it's, um, it's awful chilly out. Well, if you'll observe closely, I'm the possessor of an overcoat and a rather serviceable Benny, which... Wouldn't you like a nice cup of tea? I beg your pardon. You, you like tea, don't you, Mr. Campion? I... I don't understand. And uh, tomorrow we can pick up a second-hand hot plate. Oh, yeah. yeah, sure. We'll get you a new one. Mr. and Mrs. Crocky, please t t take a very close look at me. My name is Campion. I have been living here for six months, during which time you must have seen that I am not affluent in any way. I have no influence with the governor. I know no politicians. I know no statesmen. What little money I have, I spend for bare necessities. In short, Albert, Carolyn, why are you spreading this soft soap with such a lavish hand? Well, we're willing to let bygones be bygones. Oh? 
Well, thank you very much for the offer of tea, but I shall take a walk just the same. You go the way we did. I know he will. I can't. Now close the door. And what if he does? All he'll see is that Sedgwick laid in the alley. We didn't kill him. Anybody could see it was an auto that done it. And Campion can't know about the money he had. Sedgwick was only here a few days. But but we got to hide it. In case. In the mattress with the rest. Oh, we ain't got time. Huh? What if Mr. Campion does know about the money? What if he sees Mr. Sedgwick and he comes back here? We ain't got time to open the mattress and close it again. And the mattress is the best place. All our money has always been safe no, in the mattress. No, no, no time. Um, put it in the fireplace until tomorrow morning. And then what? Well, uh, when the bank's open, you, you go clear over to the other side of town. If it's a nice day, you can walk. Um, change one of the big bills into little ones. You're crazy. What good's that going to do? You'll, you'll see. Now, now listen. And then... Go to another bank and put the little bills in the bank account. Oh, we ain't got none. You can open one. Maybe do the same thing for a week until all the money is out of here. See, nobody knows us on the other side of town. Yeah. I see. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> and then when we're good and sure uh -huh. that nobody else knows about the money. Uh-huh. We can take it out of the bank and bring it back here. <laughs> That's smart. Pretty smart, Carolyn. I bet even Mr. Smarty Pants Camion couldn't think of nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a splendid idea, Albert and Carolyn. You sigh with relief and settle to sleep, which you can't. Then it's morning. You leave the house, Albert, and your pocket is a hundred-dollar bill. You start for a bank across town, a bank where no one knows you. You reach the bank and give the bill to one of the tellers. He looks at you, hard. Is there some suspicion in his glances? Is there, Albert? But he changes the bill and you hurry out. You start for another bank blocks away. But before you get there, a newspaper headline catches your eye. You can't read it all, but two words make you start and turn pale. Bank robbery. You read as much as you can, but your lifelong miserliness doesn't let you spend a nickel for that paper. One phrase strikes your eye. Marked money. Now you hurry home. The other bank is forgotten. You should take a taxi. But you don't think of it, even though fives and tens are clutched in your pocket. The dampness from your hand making them a pulpy mess. Now you're home. Safe. There. Uh, Crockett. I, I can't stop now, Mr. Campion. Okay, so you can't stop, but don't you don't you want to know why this policeman is here? P policeman? Where? Using the phone down the hall. It seems our good friend, Mr. Sedgwick, has some shady dealings. Sedgwick? Well, well yes, you see. The... I, I gotta go to Carolyn. I, I went out to get some medicine. The, the, well, the, the law will wait, Mr. Crockett. The law will wait. Carolyn! Carolyn! Is, is, is the policeman gone, Albert? No, he ain't. I saw him coming down the street while I was looking out the window for you. I didn't say nothing. Then I heard the policeman and Mr. Campion talking. Now, you tell me what they were saying. I couldn't hear it good. I put my ear up against the door. I, I couldn't hear nothing but low talk. Oh, the money. That's what he's here for. That's what he's here for. Where's the rest of it? Still in the fireplace. I'll get it. Are they going to arrest us, Albert? Oh, are they going to arrest us for taking the money from Sedgwick? The newspaper said it was marked. The bandit took marked money from the bank. The oh. serial numbers was all wrote down. That Mr. Sedgwick must have stolen it. Now we got it. Oh, we, we got to give it back. Here, here, take it. You're crazy. Then we got to admit we took it off Sedgwick. Sedgwick, he was a crook. We got to get rid of this money. Albert, what are you doing? Burning it. Oh! Let go of my arm. Let go of my oh. arm. Oh. Tell her the bank. He looked oh. funny at me. He must have called the police when I left the oh. bank. You're burning oh, it. Now you You're shut burning up. It. It's all burning. Shut up. Oh, Albert, Albert, you didn't have to hit me. You didn't have to hit me. Shh, quiet. That's a policeman. You keep him away. Money's nearly gone, and he can come in. Go ahead. Don't stand there like a fish. Go ahead. Who? Who, who is it? Champion with a stout minion of the law. Name of... Um... Sergeant McCarthy. 
He says his name is McCarthy. All right. Just a couple of seconds more. Just a couple of seconds. I, I, I ain't dressed. Oh, come, 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 Mrs. Crockett. It's after ten. You were up early this morning. I heard you. Uh, it's done, Carolyn. Now you can let him in. Well, Albert and Carolyn, your chase is won, isn't it? You thought it was your lucky night that your good friend Mr. Sedgwick lying dead in the alley would turn out to be a profitable investment after all. You thought you'd be able to stuff his money into your mattress with the rest of your hoard, didn't you? But there were too many strings attached to that $5,000. That's why you're relieved now as you watch the last of it smolder in the grate as the door opens to admit Sergeant McCarthy and Mr. Campion. Well, what is it, officer? What about Mr. Sedgwick? Well, when we found his body lying there in the alley, we had to find out where he was staying. That's why I'm here. Now, you say he's been living here, eh? Only for two days. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't know nothing about him. Well, of course, honest folks wouldn't. Uh, he had a record a yard long and more aliases than you could shake a stick at. Uh, as soon as I read about the bank robbery, I said to Carolyn, that Sedgwick is the kind of man who looks like a robber. Sedgwick, mm -hmm. a bank robber? Is that right, Sergeant? Oh, Lord, no, Mr. Campion. Small stuff with Sedgwick's line sneak even. Why, he'd sneak little stuff out of hotel rooms in boarding houses. Say, is there anything missing from here? Trinkets or some cash, eh? No, nothing we know of. Ah, good, good. No, Sedgwick was no bank robber. Uh, besides, the bank robbery you read about is all cleared up. All the money's recovered. No, that's not right. Well, it's all in the morning papers. Uh, but Crockies never buy newspapers, Sergeant McCarthy. Papers cost a whole nickel. Sedgwick had $5,000. 5000 Well, how do you know? He had it, we know. Not a penny on him when we found him. You say that he robbed hotels and boarding houses? Yes. Albert, Carolyn, did you by any chance keep money in your room here? Well, now, did you? The mattress! Here, the mattress! It's been slid open. Our savings, our own money. It's gone. You, you burned our money. Oh, you fool, you burned our own money. Our own. Sedgwick stole our money. We got it back just by luck. But you burned it. You burned our own money. All our savings. All those years of scrimping and saving, and you burned it. Our own money. Oh. In the animal world, there is the hunter and the hunted. Hound and fox, hawk and sparrow, chicken and worm. But who is to judge precisely which is the pursuer or the pursued as we enter the chase? The chase was created for the National Broadcasting Company by Lawrence Cleese. This story was by Russell Hughes. Heard in the cast were Virginia Payne, Arnold Moss, Martin Rudy, and Louis Van Ruten. The chase is directed and transcribed by Fred Way. Fred Collins speaking. Next week, greed and avarice join the pursuit for a hidden fortune when you listen to The Million Dollar Chase. Tonight, meet the Veep on NBC.